Boonika, can you uh, hear me clearly? Just want to make sure the mic and uh, everything is set up well. Can you hear me right now? I just sent you a message. Okay, perfect. Okay. Let's we'll wait a little longer. Let me get some more uh, people. All right, more viewers. Okay. Okay, sure. So I can begin. So um, I guess a little introduction about myself. Uh, I'm studying, finishing off my uh, bachelor's at U of T, doing computer science and cognitive science. And um, my interests are mainly within applications of machine learning into areas of innovation, particularly within healthcare and some social issues as well. Uh, last January, at a programming competition, um, me along with the partner Hamal Chowdhury, we developed this product. It was basically a 3D printed robotic prosthetic arm. It had a camera embedded in the palm. And when it sees an object, like let's say for instance a glass, it'll know based on the uh, computer vision how to autonomously grasp it appropriately. And so we took it off from this initial local competition. We went to uh, Imagine Cup regionals 
Um, and then from there, we went to the World Finals. Um, this has all happened throughout the summer. Um, and yeah, we placed, we placed first place. A uh, very, very incredible experience. And um, I was invited by Abu Anika to help share some of what we, um, I saw and experienced going through the event, as well as provide any advice I could um, for anybody who's interested in, in somehow getting involved with like minimal tech expertise. So um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. You people, you can leave uh, a comment um, and I can address them address them through there. So at any point, anybody who's watching, you can feel free to drop a comment and um, yeah, I can answer it. In regards to anything related to technology, how to get involved with, with starting your own project, because um, that's definitely possible um, right now for, I think, especially people, you know, that are young or that are in school around the age of 20, I think, um, especially there's a lot of opportunity. So um, yeah, again, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, just, just feel free to comment. Um, I know that's sort of probably a little bit late right now in Sri Lanka. Um, over here, uh, it's it's ten a.m., so it's actually just the morning in Toronto. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Bo and Nico, you can uh, start us off if you'd like. But maybe I should make a little um, post underneath the video. Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't been seeing the comments. Okay. Um, so I'll answer the first question. So what is it what is it what does one take to get selected to the Microsoft and Madden Cup World Finals? Okay, good. So um I think basically the there's gonna be three sort of uh pillars to your idea. So you wanna have obviously a good technological innovation, you wanna have a good social innovation and a sort of business innovation. So when you're thinking about your project, you want to think along those three things. So obviously the innovation needs to be technically competent. So we can walk through this with the example of SmartArm, where we have this arm that uses computer vision technology 
some cloud computing through like an onboard Raspberry Pi. And it's leveraging all this interesting technology. So of, of course, there's a big innovation in that aspect. But that alone wasn't enough to get selected into the Imagine Cup World Finals. What you needed was some sort of social kind of innovation too. So another big thing that's presented was the fact that it was much more affordable by um, amputees to access an appropriate prosthetic. And so there's kind of a social innovation in the sense that now it's giving, the idea is that it's gonna be giving access to many more um, amputees to a, a sort of functional prosthetic. The business innovation as well is on the fact that because we're kind of leveraging this cloud computing aspect of it, people are going to have access to this to this cloud of, uh, of data to help uh, tune, you know, the uh, computer vision to the, to the actual grasping. So it kind of runs on a subscription model where, you know, a user would pay a small monthly fee and they'd be able to take advantage of the services associated to the arm. And so when you're thinking of an idea, Again, it's still early on, so so don't get scared off. But when you're getting close to the date, you want to th start thinking about uh, how can I actually also turn this into like a business model where this is going to actually help people and they're going to want to buy the product in order to help them. So make sure you're thinking along those three things and you know, you'll know you have a better idea. And again, if anybody has some ideas, you can message me and I can do my best to, to tell you what I think. Um, but again, just make sure you hit those three axes. It's actually on the website and I can post a link afterwards. They actually lay it out very clearly exactly what you need um, to apply and get selected for Imagine Cup. So again, feel free. I, I, I didn't even, when we were going through the whole application process, I really didn't think we would, um, you know, I wasn't sure that we would get in because I didn't know what the competition was like, if people had better kind of, you know, uh, better technology, the social and the business. But I would just 100% recommend people to just try it out because um, you never know, you'll get in, you don't know how far you'll take it. Maybe maybe you'll win the next next one too. So I definitely recommend Theodore to uh, apply. So that was a good question. Um, okay, what sort of things you recommend? So this is from Malindu Warapitia. What sort of things you recommend to someone who is getting started on AI machine learning, learning materials, tools, languages? Sure. So Melinda, again, you can feel free to elaborate a little bit more and tell me if I'm answering the question the best um, that you want me to. Uh, I think for us, for instance, so I we started this project after, you know, I had only been programming for like a sort of year and I, and I hadn't actually, I don't believe I had uh, done specifically AI machine learning. Um, although it depends on what level you're talking about. So just to get started, I would definitely recommend, I think, using some of those API that are out there. So by API, I mean the software that the, some of these big companies put out there. So Microsoft, they have their software associated to the computer vision stuff, but they actually do, um, you know, you, you're kind of just like taking snippets of their code, which they, they have online, and you're making calls to their servers so that you can use their, their actual co computing power and, and leverage that on the results onto your computer. So that way you're not actually going deeply in depth to having to learn everything associated with machine learning, but it gives you an initial initial idea of what you can start to do with it. And so this was really important for us because again, I didn't come from an AI background necessarily. And so just using that, it helped a lot. So again, if you uh, need specific uh, resources, I can, I can uh, comment you uh, to some of the ones that Microsoft has available on their website, but that would be a start. The other thing, uh, language-wise specifically, uh, Python um, has libraries that kind of facilitate the whole machine learning um, classifier stage. So I would definitely recommend looking into that. Um, you'll be managing a lot of data frames in Python too. So, so yeah, if you want to get more specific, again, feel free to ask a question. Yeah, happy to answer more questions. But you really, I think, just don't want to be uh, kind of scared off when you're doing AI or machine learning, because um, 
it's a, it's talked about a lot right now, and I think you just want to make sure that you can start to be able to first see what you're what you're what you're able to do with it, and then you get an idea of is it is this something that you know you'll enjoy learning the materials for, developing the skill sets to make use of the tools. You want to use this these these APIs first. That's that's what I what I think works well, and then and then you can start diving into um, the specifics of it of like you know pre-processing databases and and then applying an algorithm to that but start off you know using some of the high level machine learning api and 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 yeah you'll that'll be a great way to get your foot in to the door initially How can someone from an electronics background transition to machine learning? Okay, yeah, good question. So coming from an electronics background, so I guess it'll depend a lot on what the uh, what the purpose is. I mean, if you're coming from an electronics background, I mean, you know, there there is a bit of a distinction from the application you can do machine learning. However, with, with SmartArm, obviously, uh, my partner, Hamile, was coming more from the mechatronic side of it. Um, and he, yeah, he uh, definitely transitioned. Um, but, well, like more so applying the machine learning to the electronic stuff, which was interesting. Um, maybe specifically, I would recommend, depending on where your where, where your background is, you want to start to first see well, where is machine learning going to be important when you're applying it to electronics. So in our case, because we were dealing with classifying grip movements, it involved actually, you know. On the uh, Raspberry Pi that we were using, that was connected to all of these motors, we needed to actually make sure that the machine learning was connected to the to the motor usage, so that the arm would move in accordance to what was classified. And so, once the problem was clear that that's what we needed to do, it becomes a, little, a bit more easy because you'll, you'll you'll start to see the application. You start to think about, okay, well, what do I need to classify? And so. Once you start to do that, then you'll start to think about what, what, what electronic piece do I need to provide input to in order for the classification to be expressed in the, in, in, in the idea. So that's one, one way I recommend um, you know, getting going from electronics to machine learning. You need to see the connection between the two first. Um, and OK, Melinda, we got a follow up from you. Um, as a Sri Lankan, I know that there are thousands of engineer graduates per year within Sri Lanka. I believe most importantly, innovative ideas are lacking. What can they do to improve on this? Okay, yeah, that is that is a big problem because it, it does seem like there's a big saturation of um, people with the same skill set, but not being able to apply this into different areas. I think um, a big a big thing to to and I don't know how the situation specifically is with Sri Lanka, but it is to I think take advantage of. Some of these competitions will help you get get your feet off of the ground and start to think about where innovation will be possible. Because right now, I'm not sure how the ecosystem is as much in, in Sri Lanka, but these, for instance, Microsoft's competition provides a good way for people being raised in Sri Lanka to, to make some sort of crazy idea and then start to take it far. So... I'd recommend exploring um, some of the competitions that are available and starting to get your, your, your feet off the ground there. Your main thing is you want to find a problem that can be solved in an interesting way with, through technology that has those components of the technological, social, and business innovation so that when you go about doing your project, I think, I think it'll actually help so that the innovation um, could possibly spread more. Because again, you don't just want uh, a ton of engineers just working, um, you know, for these companies. It might be a, a good idea to present some more opportunities. And so, a lot of this would mean exploring more of the the startup and entrepreneurial space. Um, but again, again, I don't know what the uh, what the factors are looking like within within Sri Lanka for that. Um, but yeah, like where I'm just curious with Sri Lanka, where do the um, is there is there much of a startup ecosystem? So this may be more of a question for 
for you guys that I'm curious about. But um, how have you seen other people get involved with with wanting to do innovative ideas or or get involved with with, with making their own startup? What is that kind of like? Because I'm I'm curious. Because um, again, I do I do think it's important if we have so many um, engineers. So I'm I'm sure Sri Lanka there's a lot of um, the technical competency, but how is it being used? Um, and I think this is the case with with many countries. But yeah, I'm I'm curious. Okay, that question. I'll try my best to, to actually reply to these comments so that the answers are kind of there. Um, so another one, how can one make an idea stand out in a global competition like Imagine Cup. Yeah, good, good, good idea. Good question. Um, stand out. I think. Well, I think a big thing that helped us stand out was the fact. Well, one, we actually had some physical hardware that um, people could people could see, and so when we when we actually did a demo of it, you can see the arm physically picking it up. We can give it to somebody, they can actually hold it and look at the different parts of it. And I think that was one of the things that really helped us stand out. We, we made sure that we took advantage of the fact that we had this physical model that you can actually feel and play with. Because a lot of the case, a lot of what you're going to see in these competitions are like just all software and apps dedicated to that. So I, I guess I'm not necessarily go out and, and do something hardware related. But something that involves a different skill set that that is clearly different from just coming out with a new you know app phone app necessarily, but something more interesting and something more more engaging, so that when people do come by and talk to you at the competition, they'll remember you because there's something that's very clearly makes you uh, stand out. So again, like hardware is one direction, um, but again, just try to think about different skill sets that 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 leverage this. Um, so like, well, for instance, one one idea I could tell you is, uh, uh, this is a team from last year that came first place within the Canadian um, finals. So they had an interesting idea of taking um, a Microsoft Connect and they had a person walk up and down so the camera would just kind of watch and they would be able to identify based on their physical body movements or what kind of a neuromuscular disorder that the, the person might be facing. And so. Again, this is kind of leveraging some material they were working with, I believe, um, somebody who was doing the residency in med school. And they were leveraging this other skill set. And it was a very interesting application because um, now it's really engaging, right? You have this uh, camera and someone's actually walking up and down. You can actually test that out. And when judges come by, it's much more engaging. You know, you, you can see that this is a very interesting idea and that you can use it right away. So, uh, again, I would definitely recommend that to help um, a team stand out. Uh, okay, we have another question from Hasita. Um, how did you set up the team for Imagine Cup? Uh, so the team was me and my project partner, Hamal Chowdhury. So he was actually a, a friend from uh, middle school. And how it kind of happened was with that, that local programming competition that I, that I spoke about that happened back in January, uh, we actually ran into each other. It was kind of serendipitous because we hadn't seen each other in so many years, and both of us came into the to the to that local pro competition without an idea um, or a team in mind. So uh, at that competition is where we actually started exchanging ideas and you know did everything over 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 that competition. And so after that, we you know we won with that local competition for Microsoft. Um, but you know this was before Imagine Cup, and so what really um, helped was a lot of the sponsors from uh, Microsoft were telling us, you know, you should come in as a team and come go through Imagine Cup, and so it kind of started from there. We didn't, it, it, we didn't specifically think about the fact that oh, we're gonna take this to this competition. 
we kind of met up and realized that we can make something really cool. And then Microsoft started telling us, well, you know, you can, this is a good idea. I know you're going to continue forward with it, but why don't you come take it through this competition as well? And so the team kind of formed very naturally. Um, but what was really valuable, um, I think what might help you understand if you wanted to get involved with this is you want to look for somebody that has a very different skill set from you. So again, with Hamile, he had more of the um, skill set within mechatronics engineering and the 3D printing. And so and the actual physical development of the hand, he was very helpful for that. And because I had the computer vision and machine learning aspect of it, we were able to put the two together and, and come up with something pretty cool. So I would, again, really encourage that because that's where the innovation comes from, right? When, you, when you're coming at an idea from a different perspectives that haven't really been seen before. And if you're all going to be just coming in as software engineers, it's going to be actually hard to see an interesting problem to, to approach um, and come up with, the, with an innovative solution. So definitely different skill sets. I really recommend that for sure. Um, okay, and Hasita, we got another question. How was the timeline like when you were developing the product till the end? So with this kind of design, it's, it's an iterative design process. So there isn't, um, until release, we're still iterating through different product designs. But how it basically goes is you want to um, come up with a mock-up. You want to first design it and make some assumptions about, well, what kind of things would a user want to actually have incorporated on the prosthetic? So this involves a little bit of user experience uh, kind of design. When you're going about any sort of kind of project, technical and otherwise, you, you really want to have it uh, end, end user focus. So part of what we did we made it at that hackathon, and then we were like, okay, you want to, you, what you kind of want to do is you want to validate it with customers. So you want to start thinking about the user, and you want to actually check in with them and see, is this development actually looking like what we want it to look like? Because, again, this is for you. So what we did, we, we found a friend back um, um, in home in Toronto, and um, she was a, a congenital amputee. So she was born with a... Uh, with limb loss and what she uh she basically did we we went in we we had kind of like a like an interview with her we had her hold the arm try on try on the armband and 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 try to troubleshoot a little bit and we got some initial feedback from her and so we kind of used that to reincorporate into the design so some of the things that we should take it to take into factor are things like the weight for instance because you don't realize these things as you as you're just kind of you know just developing it you need to get input from the users. So we realized, OK, we need to maybe focus on material design that can help lower the weight of this. Um, the other thing is like you want to think about battery life. So when somebody is actually walking around with this, you don't want it to, to die on them in the, in the middle of the day because it's going to be you know running this onboard Raspberry Pi computer on, onto the arm. And so when, uh, when we're developing this, that's another thing that we started thinking about. Well, how is that going to work? So again, it's, it's, it's like an iterative process. So it's going to keep, um, keep kind of changing and, 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 and developing. Um, and so, yeah, like for instance, down the road, or one thing we're going to think of incorporating is there's going to be uh, two cameras. So one kind of up here, one kind of here, so that we can better start to see, is this able to actually capture, um, you know, do the computer vision stuff when it sees like this glass, for instance, is it going to do a better job of actually um, sculpting, knowing exactly how to grasp it? So these things are going to change as we start to trial it um, and and see how more and more people respond to it as they use it. So um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if I got a little sidetrack. So your uh, how was the timeline? Um, okay, to get at that question a little bit more. Um, well, you you want to make it alongside some of the industry partners that you're that you're working with, or at least talking to. So, when you're thinking about what, what when to hit certain checkpoints, you want to keep yourself accountable by talking to certain people within the industry that you're working with. So, for instance, um, with us, well, well, some of the deadlines were kind of associated with the competition. You know, we were like, okay, this is this is another good thing with competitions. You'll you'll be able to start to think about, okay, I want we need to have this thing done. For, for the competition, so you'll make sure. Um, on the other hand, um, like let's say for instance, we're working with a doctor, um, which we have gotten in touch with in Toronto. Um, it would be, you know, talking to them and asking them also, 
Well, what do you need to see for us to bring it into your, you know, your prosthetics division in your hospital and talk to, um, you know, another doctor towards getting the solution fit for somebody? What do you need? And then you can start to think about the development alongside that as well. So in terms of your timeline, um, you want to be thinking about some of those things as well. So your industry partners, um, your customer validation, um, yeah, you definitely want to be thinking about those. Yeah, these are good questions. These are good questions. I think the main thing I want is for um, people to know that it is it is possible to like get involved and and apply. Like you know, you really don't know if you're slightly interested with an innovation and doing something through technology in some way. Um, you should at least apply. Like don't don't be afraid. Um, if you're interested at all, um, trust me, you have no you have no idea how far something will take you. And like this is the case uh, for me, and I don't see why um, it shouldn't be the case for for so many people um, as well. So, yeah. Okay, great. I see that we got another question. What are the the things? And also, you can let me know if I'm if I'm getting your question right, or if or if you need to you know answer it in a different way. Uh, what are the things students need to reconsider if, sorry, need to consider if they're hoping to make medical related product? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, I like this question because I, I think especially right now, um, I like seeing technology enter more of the medical and healthcare sphere. I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity to improve that and I think help people, um, you know, especially countries where there isn't much of a, a good good healthcare system. Um, but what you need to consider, uh, well, first, uh, for, first of all, I think, again, going back to the idea of your team, you wanna have the team dynamics where you have that spread within skill set very, very clearly. So right off the bat, so, you know, you wanna have some engineers on your team, well, you wanna try to have somebody who has some medical related uh, knowledge and skill set so that they can let you know well, look, this is actually going to be helpful in, in a hospital. This is what doctors want to use. You won't know that as well as, as somebody who's working within medical. So that's one of the things, your team. Um, the second thing is, I don't know. Uh, so you, you want to think about the, the related policies around designing technology for medical use because you only want to think about um, who's going to be using it and if you're going to have to sell it through a hospital, for instance, to to get the doctors to recommend it to patients, you need to think about what policies that you need to abide by and maybe get checked in order for that to happen. So with SmartArm, for instance, since we're designing a prosthetic, um, one of the things we have to look into is if this is considered like a medical device, and if so, then what procedure does that have to go through in order for doctors to want to adopt it within the hospital? So with that for instance we learned about like the socket so that's going to be the part that goes over the the residual limb and that part would be considered the medical device and we can build our arm off on top of that so those are the kinds of things that we had to consider in making a, a, a sort of medical related product um so there's there, it's hard to say some sort of hard and fast rule but i would recommend having a doctor on your team or or some sorry somebody related to healthcare and then talking to people more people within that industry to, to get a better idea. So again, always, always stay connected to the industry that you're, that you're wanting to, um, you know, provide some innovation in, or else you won't really know if it's a good, a good, good direction or not. Um, thank you for the question. Feel free to uh, elaborate some more. Um, Buanika, what would be the rate of risk if undergraduates work on medical related projects and how can they overcome these? The rate of risk of uh, under hmm. risk. Uh, hmm, I don't. I don't know if they're. I mean, again, just make sure that you abide by the the policies that are related to um, designing one of these one of these products. Um, risk wise, yeah, I guess you'll want to see to make sure that you're not just trying to sell some sell some project without actually realizing well you're going against a certain health law. So. Again, the biggest risk is just not realizing the policy and then and then going against that when when starting to build your product or sell your product. So definitely that that the risk would just be not realizing that you're breaking policy. So make sure 
in order to overcome that, again, make sure that you have a team where you can bring somebody on who has some some uh, perspective of the industry and won't um, will know that okay, we're gonna have to get this checked. We're gonna go have to talk to this doctor, for instance, or we're gonna have to go have to pass this uh, safety procedure in in using this this sort of device. So. Yeah, again, it's all about staying connected to your industry. So, yeah. It all depends on the kind of idea. You need to, with with our case, it was kind of, it was kind of clear, like we want to talk to like an occupational therapist or a doctor that actually assigns prosthetics to an amputee. So then we have an idea. But for different projects, it's going to be uh, different things, different people that you're going to need to talk to. Yeah, thank you for the question. So I'm just wondering what kind of ideas actually, uh, do you end up seeing a lot of um, technology that's associated with medical related products in Sri Lanka? Um, I'm curious to, to hear if that's the case. Okay, I see another question. What were the mistakes and lessons learned along the way in Magic Cup? Hmm, mistakes and lessons. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, mistakes. I think. Okay, well, I, I don't know if I would call this um, a mistake necessarily, but I think I would have just taking, taken more advantage of getting to know what other teams are doing. Because um, when you're in that environment, um, and same thing I think goes for like the programming competitions. Um, yeah, instead of being so focused on just, you know, working on your project and, and, and doing well, like it's a really good idea to go around and see what else is possible. Because, I mean, at this at this age, like, this is probably not going to be your last idea that you come up with. And it's better that early on you can get, explore and have a, you know, wide, wide perspective of what's actually possible for you. You're starting to see what other people your age are doing. It really broadens your perspective. And so, um, you know, while I did that at, at Imagine Cup, and it did, like, help me a lot in the long run and just thinking about, well, what else can I be doing? And it's so interesting seeing how, you know, some of these people are going about solving problems, especially ones that are close to their um, community. Um, yeah, again, I would I would make sure that you take advantage of the environment. When you're exposed to people that are doing really fascinating things, make sure you talk to them, and you get as much as you can out of out of out of that. Um, so that's one thing. Another mistake. Um, okay, well, here's something that sounds like a mistake, but uh, not necessarily, but a big lesson came out of it. So with when you're demoing your product, I guess you wanna you wanna really make sure that it's working every single time you 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 keep going, you're practicing different environments. you make sure. And I say that because actually, in our very final pitch, when it was just the top three teams left, we our demo failed. So we were on stage, um, and I'm not sure some of you might know this, but w when it was our whole live perform or, or presentation was happening, our, our arm didn't work um, on the table. So we, you know, that, that, that could come off as a really bad thing, but I guess what we learned, and we kind of did this in, in our pitch, luckily, is we, you know, I was nervous. I was like, okay, you know, this isn't going to work. You know, is this a bad sign? But I was like, okay, well, we have more things to say. We're going to move on from this and we're going to focus on getting to um, telling you the rest about the project that we're working on. And so we quickly just got out of that and focused on on talking about what we needed to talk about so that, yeah, and what we heard a lot back from the judges and, and a lot of people, were, they were just saying that that was a very good transition. Even though it failed, it was, it was clear that you were level-headed and that you 
wanted to focus on on finishing what you were talking about with 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 your with smart arm and so a big lesson learned is like there will be mistakes like this that are going to happen in your life like if you're getting into innovation and 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 doing pitches on your projects and ideas or even within a workplace if you're working for a big company and you have to do a presentation you know you're supposed to um, show how this this new feature that you just implemented is is functional and then it fails the big lesson is um don't don't fo focus on that you think the technology of course we're going to have these little glitches and it's going to fail every once in a while don't get so caught up on it you just want to you just want to keep moving forward and they'll see you, you people will be able to see by the fact that you're moving forward that you know this 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 glitch it wasn't a big deal this mistake it wasn't it wasn't a big deal that that you know um it'll work the next time but right now you're focused on telling your idea so that was another big thing that we learned um yeah yeah i think those would be some of the two big takeaways uh from imagine cup um maybe presenting too so i can make a list list of these uh i'll make a list of this when i reply to your comment but you might be nervous also if this is like not your if this is your first time maybe presenting or you know pitching an idea that you have in front of a lot of people because it can be personal right you come up with an with an interesting idea um and you're worried about what people will think so when you're, you're talking about it you're a little bit shy you're not very confident that's something i learned early on in in imagine cup because originally i was wasn't a big public speaker but afterwards i, I think i think i really enjoy it now because um you know you want to focus on getting your ideas out there and it's it's a very interesting process um and so like early on you don't want to make the mistake of 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 feeling too shy thinking that your idea isn't good enough that that's a mistake it's a mistake to just to just convince yourself that your idea isn't good enough you want to um, start off really confident you want to have your vision very clearly that this is this is where i see the world in 20 years with my project and you want to you I, I especially for these kinds of competitions you want to be kind of have like a, a strong vision over over um what's what's possible so yeah so okay just to recap what do we what do we just go over um take advantage of the environment you're in um don't be afraid to fail and um what was the last point i just made i just forgot Okay, hopefully, hopefully you caught that one. I just forgot. Um, yeah. So next, next question: Medical details are confidential. How can one get access to these confidential data when participating in global competitions? Yeah. So th this, this is definitely another, another case. So I guess prior to participating in a big competition, if you want to get access to that data, you need to start working with um people early on within the medical industry so that you can start piloting your idea so you for instance you, you go to the doctor you tell them you know i want to do this kind of machine learning analysis on this data set will you let me try it out or what's the procedure how do i how do i how do i get um access to and analyzing this while i'm keeping confidentiality so again this comes back to talking to your industry partners early on you have an idea go reach out to the person that would be able to take it to the next step within your community somebody who's in that industry so that's one thing the other thing is well of course yeah you're not always going to be able to get access to the data so early on at this stage like it's okay to like uh show kind of just like a proof of concept which would be showing that if you had the data this is how the analyses would work and so um sometimes you know you can you can come up with a data set and and just show people that this is how it would work um and that's what and that that's again this is in the early stages right you don't actually know yet so which is why you're gonna have to go and validate it but when it's at an early stage it is okay to 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 say like this is how it would hypothetically work you know because you're just showing them that this is th this is the concept but when again you want to make sure that you start getting paired to industry right away so that you can actually show this is this is it working because look now now that we have the actual data this is it working um okay what made you decide to continue the product you built as a startup? Um, so I think the big thing was seeing the business potential in it. So, sorry, excuse me. I think the big thing is the business potential. So 
while it's not, it, it was like, okay, a cool idea that we came up with, the big thing is that there's potential to actually start getting this and accessible to, to users all over. So what really helped motivate that was talking to some people and seeing like, yeah, they could see a big use for this. That, you know, we, we even talking to the doctors, they were just like, yeah, this, this seems like a, like a good idea that, that, you know, we could, we might be interested in, in, in buying and providing to our patients. And so it was, it was those, those points where like, we could see that, okay, there's an interest from industry and that we can scale this uh, project up so that it can be built as a startup and we can distribute SmartArm um, through that means. And we think also that way it'll have like a big impact because we'll be able to, um, you know, make make a name for it as a company so that, um, you know, people are made more aware of it in hospitals and, and these amputee organizations that might want to adopt these prosthetics. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the questions, Azita. These are these are all really good questions. So I got a few more minutes. So if anybody has any um, any more questions, I'd be happy to answer. And I, and I think it should be fine, like, if, if there are any questions later on, um, I think you can comment on the video afterwards. Um, and then I can I can go back and message it. I hope this is helpful for, for those that were watching. You can contact the Sustainable um, Education Foundation and uh, provide them some feedback on what was useful or what might be more useful for a future future Q&A that, that, that we do. Um, yeah, just uh, whatever, whatever is most helpful. Cause you know, I wanna, I'd wanna make sure that people know that they can, um, take their idea from from places like, um, Sri Lanka and make it onto the world stage at Imagine Cup. I think it's definitely possible. Um, so I highly encourage people to to try it out and apply. Uh, will we see your product in the market within the next year? Um, <laughs> so that's hard to say. Um, so I don't want to want you to hold me to my word. Um, we're hoping to basically do clinical trials within the hospital first, so we can first see how well it's going to work. So kind of like a pilot project. And then afterwards, we need to know how much we're going to have to go back and redesign so that and then we might try another clinical trial depending on how things go because our main thing is we, we want to make sure that the the product is going to be safe to use at um um you know for for amputees and that is comfortable you know so before all of that we need to put a lot of work into making sure that it's tested very well so again it might it's going to involve this clinical trial going back and redesign this goes back to the idea of, of how do we make our timeline for product development right and it's and it's iterative so we're gonna do that and then and then we'll be able to start to see, well, okay, maybe we'll need another clinical trial or hey, maybe we've seen by this test that um, we're we're ready. So then we will take it into market afterwards. So um, yeah, so it's hard to say right now. Um, Asita, we see great products at hackathons and competitions like Imagine Cup, but they never continue like you did. What's your advice for them? Uh, yeah, so my advice for these products, I, you know, I really wish that people do continue after a hackathon because, you know, you shouldn't just leave your idea there. There's, there's so much you can, you can do with it afterwards, but my, my advice is, well, I mean, okay. The thing is, if, if you want to leave your idea at your hackathon, I mean, that could also just be showing that you, you don't, you didn't have the passion to continue it on. Um, so that's one thing and that's also okay. Um, so that's fine, 
But if it's more of a problem of, you know, motivation and also maybe, maybe um, ambition, you can't, you can't take them further. So like, don't, don't think that this is where it needs to stop. Um, hackathons and competitions are just where you can see, you know, everybody doing everything at once, but you know, things are happening behind the scenes. So when, when you're done the hackathon, you can go and take it to, again, whoever your industry partner is, whatever kind of idea it is. Like for instance, let's say you created like a new food delivery system with drones or something like that. You don't have to leave that at the hackathon. Afterwards, go and start talking to like some big um, food chains, for instance, that might be interested in this new delivery service that you have. Find the people within your network or, or, or find uh, a message people on LinkedIn. Find some sort of platform where you'll be able to get those points of contact within that industry. And then you can maybe see, well, what do they think about this? Do they think it's a good idea? Because uh, you need to ask that first to know. If you never ask that, then the answer will always be, be no. But for instance, if they say yes, then now you know that you can take this idea a bit farther. You can ask them, okay, well, what do you need me to do to, in order to make this something that you, would, that you would buy from me? And then again, you go back into your product development and then you change it up a little bit and then you go back out and then you ask them again, is this something that you would, uh, that you would use? And then, you know, then they'll, then they'll again be able to tell you no or yes. And you go back or, or you're able to start to sell to them. So, um, yeah, I think the big thing is get involved with the industry. Um, don't just work on it on your own. Don't work on it just by yourself. These ideas are not going to get big just by focusing so much on just, just you and your team. You need to go out and talk to different people within your networks. That's what I really recommend. Um, even like any venture capitalists or big investors, um, it might be good to just talk to them, get an idea of where you need to be in order to get an investment. So yeah, that would, that would be my big recommendation. Big advice. Um, at the moment, is your startup bootstrap or funded? If funded, any advice on getting funds? So right now we're receiving grants from a venture capitalist and it's based on that funding that we're um you know doing more of the iterative design luckily at this early stage um the costs are really going to be more with 3d printing and there are a lot of facilities that provide some of that um some of that access to that to, to those printers so our our costs right now have been have been relatively uh low um but if I were to give advice on getting funded, it goes back. You need to think about what a VC is looking for in you. So this kind of goes into like, um, you know, initially building a startup is general advice. Like you want to make sure your team is solid, that you have a clear vision, that you know that you're going somewhere with this. Because that's what the investors want to see. They want to see that you are committed to to your idea. So when you're going in to talk to somebody about get, receiving money, that would be the big priority that would be the big priority make sure your team is solid that, that you both or who, your whole team is just is just on the same page because that's more than anything investors will actually invest in you as a team than than your idea especially if, if you're at an early stage because again they don't have much to go off they don't they they don't see how much revenue that you made over the last year because you're just starting you're, you're a startup right so at that stage your your team is everything and your story about your idea is everything Um, how about market validation? So Sean asks, how about market validation? Um, I guess, are you asking, I guess in particularly just how you go about validating your idea within, within the market? Yeah. So market validation is a bit of a different step from customer validation. What you're, what you'll want to do is this is, this is, this is the idea of, of, of talking to your industry partner, right? So for instance, with. Um, there's kind of like a discovery phase and then a validation phase. So same thing goes with customers. You want to discover who your customer is, make some assumptions, and then you want to um, customer do customer validation. The same thing applies in the market. So you're going to have your market discovery and then your market validation. 
So within your market discovery is when you're actually just having conversations with industry partners. So for instance, us talking to the doctor at the hospital in Toronto, um, that's our discovery. That's our discovery phase because the, the, ho the hospital would be the ones that would be uh, paying us to use a product. We're, we're selling to them as an organization. So in order to start to validate that, you, that that's, how, that's why we do some of the paid pilot projects, right? So doing like a, a set of clinical trials where people get to use the product and test it out, um, then we get to see the how, the how the hospital feels about that. When we did the trials, did they like it? You know, that's when we start to validate it. That's when we start to see that they, they might be like, yes, this is, this is a really good product. Like I can see that my patients are enjoying it. Then you know that they're, they're a valid partner because they, they want to accept your solution into their market. So that's how it's going to go. You're going to have to first make those connections and then run some sort of trial or some sort of pilot project with them. And that's how you validate your market. So yeah, good question, Sean. Thank you for that. So yeah, I don't know how long I'm supposed to be on here. But if there's any last minute questions, um, I can answer you one more before I head out. Yeah, so if that's, if those are the last questions, um, thank you, Bionika. Thank you to Sustainable Education Foundation for, for, for having me. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great time for people all over the world around this age to develop some sort of innovation. I think it's a very good time for that to happen. And so, if uh, I could provide any advice to to any um, you know students in Sri Lanka that are that are, that are thinking about getting involved, um, yeah, don't don't be afraid to to see your, your the vision that you have and see it through. Um, you don't you never know how far you can take it. So, like yeah, don't 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 give up. Don't don't think too less of your idea. Um, you want to see it all the way to the point where you can't keep going anymore. That's when you know that you've actually tried. So yeah. Um, yeah, again, people feel free to feel free to comment afterwards. I can get back to uh, reply to some comments uh, afterwards. Um, and, and yeah, the, that Sustainable Education Foundation know if you found this talk helpful. Um, but yeah, again, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, thank you, everybody. Take care.